All right. Let's go ahead and get started. In our Wednesday night class, we've been studying 1 Corinthians, and we went over, over chapter 11. We came across a passage I didn't spend any time on because I knew it would be a topic for discussion on Sunday morning. In uh, 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 10. In this uh, passage, <coughs> a little background about it. We've already gone over, so Joe's just do a light like, touch on it. The discussion of whether women ought to wear veils as they prayed and prophesied or not. And it was, and Paul was bringing out the point that according to their custom, it was uncommonly for a woman to uh, go about in society, in that culture, with her head, with her hair, sh- as, as he says, her head shorn, her hair cut short. And in fact, that I guess could be considered bald. Or, uh, and, it, and by going about with her head uh, shorn, if that were a, a, an embarrassment, if that were a shame, then uh, it would be a shame for her to pray or prophesy without a, a head covering, a veil. Okay, And so according to the custom, to be consistent with the customs of that day, the women ought to wear a veil when they would pray or prophesy to show that she had a headship. And Paul makes the point that... Uh, um, Where I'm looking for the verse that, uh, let's see, the head of the man is Christ. Here it is, uh, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of the Christ is God. And so in this, he's discussing not only that of the woman, but also the man. That uh, he, he makes the point that, that men and women are different in that the women were wearing their hair long, and the men were not wearing their hair long because it was a shame to him. So his hair would be cut short. Okay. Now... In respect of that culture, I'll explain more about this in a moment, that what the women were doing, because of their, they were, they were, because of the liberty, apparently because of the liberty that, that, that the women had in Christ. You know, we're neither, as you consider that, we're all joint heirs in Christ, neither bond nor free. Uh, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, or Jew nor Greek bond nor free, male nor female, that we're all equal before God in the inheritance that will be coming to us. But that does not uh, eliminate the roles we have in the here and now while we're on this earth, that God has established that, that the man is to be the head of the woman, his wife, and the wife, her, her head, she's to submit herself to him. But the head of Christ, and of course the head of all of us, is, is uh, no, the head of man and the head of all of us is Christ. The head of Christ is God. So there is an order of hierarchy, of order of authority is more, more appropriate. So that the women there in Corinth, as apparently the, in their newfound, I say newfound liberty, the liberty they were enjoying in Christ, they were allowing some things to, in, in their behavior that, would, that was provocative in their society, uh, that they were, re, that it was indicative of their, rejecting their, 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 that they have a head over them, their husband, and that not wearing, wearing the veils. This is culture, okay? But is not saying that the teachings of the Bible is all about culture, because many people will turn to things and say, well, see, that was their culture, so therefore a lot of the teachings that they have is a matter of culture, so therefore they try to get around some of the real solid teachings regarding, well, so what are the hot spots today? Um, um, exactly, exactly. That's the first thing that came to my mind. I didn't want to say it right off the bat, because, but that is. And you know what's interesting is that apparently it was the hot spot in that day too because there's so much written about it. Why was Jesus asked about whether a man, uh, in Matthew 19, why, whether a man could divorce his wife for any cause, put away his wife for any cause, except that it was already going on and Jesus had to straighten him out. Because there were two trains of thought, two ideas, of, two colleges of thought in that idea regarding whether a man could put away his wife for any cause. One was, yea, verily he could, because Moses gave, authorized it through the giving of a bill of divorcement in Deuteronomy 24, verse 4. And, but the other college of thought was, no, it was for that unseemly thing that he found in her had to be some, something of a, of a sexual nature. Okay. So that was the thought. So Jesus set them straight. Remember I was talking about in the sermon that on the Sermon on the Mount, 
He was setting him straight on a lot of the misconceptions regarding the law of Moses. In this, too, was a misunderstanding about God's intention. In fact, he, he circumvented the whole, the, the law of Moses, and he went right back to the very beginning. Have ye not read? He who made him from the beginning made him male, both male and female. From for this cause shall he, uh, man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. And so that was the reason for uh, marriage. And, and with that cleaving to his wife, it was what God has, has joined together. As Jesus said, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Don't tear apart what God has joined together. And what they were doing through their nonchalant attitude of putting away his wife for any cause was dividing what God had joined together. And so, um, uh, as it relates to cultural things that people try to inject, say, see, this is a matter of culture. It was their culture, it was their culture that, the, that the men were the, the kings of their home, right? Well, and so they, they looked at it as domineering and that kind of stuff. Well, when you look at the marriage relationship throughout even the Old Testament and, the, of course, the New Testament, that the marriage relationship is not a domineering one. Uh, rather, it's one where the man takes his responsibility as the head of the house, and the woman submits herself to her own husband. And so, and all of this is done in love and respect, not only one for another and oneself, but also for God and his ways and his design. So as people would look at this and say, well, that's just Paul's culture. That's why he said that women are not to teach or another, any other way to usurp the authority of man, because that's just the way they were. They were chauvinists. Well, they weren't, because Paul used an argument about, he didn't talk about the way things were in their culture. He went way back again to the beginning where it was the woman who was beguiled and, and, and not the man. That's why that, that, uh, that it would be the man who would uh, <coughs> take the, the uh, dominant role when it comes, I say dominant, or authority, or head role regarding spiritual matters. Now then, so as we get to this, where Paul is discussing some issues about culture, that what it was, their culture was the women wouldn't run around with their head cut. In fact, it was, it was the uh, prostitutes, and it was the, the, the so-called priestesses of, of the, the uh, temple of Aphrodite there in Corinth, that yes, they would, they would bob their hair. I don't know if you remember, I, I did a, a research paper one time on the flapper, the, the American flapper back in the 1920s. Well, not, not exactly any of our lives. But it was, it was so provocative. It was so rebellious for a woman to cut her hair short. Because up to that time, they had created this image of, of the beautiful woman with the long flowing locks and everything, really full of hair. And so that was an indication of, of, a, of a rebellious woman. And yes, they, they were. The, the young women of, of the 1920s was rebelling against all the norms. Um, uh, much like, I guess, during the 60s when, when the youth were rebelling against all the norms in society. And so it was here that uh, seemingly it was the women, some of the women who were rebelling against this, this order of authority in the way they did things. Not so much necessarily that they were rebelling, but it was they were insensitive to the culture and the norms of that day. And it was bringing, here's the key, it was bringing reproach upon the church because of these women who were supposed to be God-fearing were showing a rebellious or, or um, um, uh, I can't think of a term I want to use, but this kind of an attitude. And so as we look at this, what can we learn from this? What can we learn is that we need to wear veils, that the women ought to wear hats when they go to worship? No, that's not it at all. We need to understand that as Christians, we've been set free, yes, and we have liberty in Christ, but we don't abuse that liberty, and we don't make an affront to our own cultural norms in the sense that we cause people to uh, ridicule or, or, or demean the church. Because have you seen what those, those people do? Okay. And so as we look at that, and so in, in this discussion, he makes this statement in verse 10. And that's what this is all about, finally. In verse 10, he says, For this cause ought the woman to have power or authority on her head because of the angels. Now, that's, that's really uh, 
has been debated and still is debated about what he meant by that because of the angels. That's what I'd like to discuss this morning. What does he mean? And, and I guess more accurately, what I, what I have learned that makes sense to me about what it could most likely mean. Okay. And it's not really mysterious or anything like that. Um, I'd like to look at some passages to give us a, some of the background about, about the angels and, and some of their activities um, relative to the church, relative to God's plan of salvation, and what kind of interest they have and the way they're ref- referred to to uh, in, in what they do. Okay, so first I'd like to look at Psalm 138. Psalm 138. Um, and it's just a single verse. As a Psalm of David, <clears throat> he writes, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praise unto thee. Now when he says gods, he's not talking about, he's not talking about the Father. He's not talking about the Holy Spirit or the or the Word, second member of the Godhead, and he's not talking about idols either. To whom is he talking? What is he talking about? It's most likely he's talking about angelic beings. Um, um, as we think about, as we'll, we'll, it'll make more sense as we go through some more passages about why he would sing his praises before the gods. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. Okay, why it would make sense it would be uh, referring to angels. Okay, um, let's look at First Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one. Um, considering that that uh, you know this, it's a, it's a fact the gospel was a mystery. It was. In God's mind, and all things had not been revealed through the Old Testament. Although the Old Testament was pointing to the Christ that would come, all things had not been revealed, and it was a mystery that the apostles were revealing as time progressed. And after that mystery had been revealed, it was no longer a mystery, it was rather could be common knowledge. But as as uh, we consider um, um Let's see. We've read this morning, we, we looked a little bit in the, in the first few verses about grace and peace being multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Okay. Um, uh, let's see here. Wait a minute. Okay. I've got Second Peter. That's why. Okay, it's First Peter. I say this is not saying what it's supposed to say. <laughs> All right. Now, so as we look in First Peter chapter one, where I sh- where I should have been to begin with, um, verse nine, beginning, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. So, what is the what is the intended purpose or the ended goal of our faith? It's the salvation of our souls. And so in receiving the salvation of our souls, which was what is we're, we're working toward, in verse 10 he makes a statement, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. So as the prophets were recording for us through inspiration about the, God's plan and how he, intended, he will, would intend to save mankind, the prophets, as they would write this, apparently they didn't understand everything they were writing. It wasn't clear to them um, exactly what was going on. In fact, you recall the, the Ethiopian eunuch who was returning from Jerusalem. He was reading the scroll of Isaiah. And as it turns out, he was reading about, in Isaiah 53, about the suffering of Christ. And he asked that, uh, the question of Philip when Philip came up to him and joined himself to the chariot. He said, asked him, do you understand everything you read? He says, well, how can it except a man uh, reveal it to me or explain it to me? And, and uh, he says, and he read the, the passage that he was studying, and, it was, uh, and he asked the question, is, is Isaiah talking about himself or, or, or another? And so it, that was like, 
just as he was a bit perplexed about what it was saying or what it was intending to, to relate, so it was the prophets who also uh, diligently, diligently looked into, inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. The grace that was to come was prophesied in the Old Testament, and we're beneficiaries of that grace that they, that they discussed, that they prophesied. In verse 11, searching what or what manner of time, not only what time, but what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. So we see here the, 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 the principle of inspiration, uh, and that it was signifying, it was given through signs, symbols, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us did they did minister to things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Now here's the thing, here's the thing. which things the angels desire to look into. So just as it was perplexing to men, as they were studying it to try to understand it, and they were considering God's salvation that, that, you know, and the grace that is to be shed upon us through his Son, that the angels desire to look into as well. So they have a curiosity, and they are wanting to see things, uh, understand. And, and so they have a natural curiosity, a natural interest in, in um, what God has revealed and in our interest as well as we consider, we'll, we'll look at Hebrews, talk about that are they not ministering spirits. Um, okay, so angels have an interest they desire to look into. Um, Matthew 18, uh, verses 2 through 5, make, Jesus makes another statement that's very interesting. It has subject to uh, misunderstanding. We discussed briefly when you're talking about guardian angels. But uh, in verses 2 through 5, you see, uh, Jesus called the little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And discussed about who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, is that they, that they needed to become as little children. And verse 6, But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and it were drowned in the depth of the sea. So not only do we see the, how God values little children, but also how God values young believers, when I say young believers, those who are believing, who are not been matured in, the, in, the, in spiritual matters. So those who are, who are, who are been recently converted, uh, he has an interest in, uh, in that he, he, he regards them very highly and that anyone who, anyone who would cause them to stumble or lose their faith, God will hold accountable and with a severe punishment. So in verse 7, woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be offenses come, but woe to the man that whom the offenses cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand, or it goes on about if there's anything that is impeding us in our search for the kingdom and our living rightly before God, we need to get rid of it. Okay. And verse 10, take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. Of course, once again, he's not necessarily talking about the little one, little children as much as those little children in, in Christ, those who are new converts, those who are, whose faith is growing. Of course, all of our faith should continually be growing, but those who are, are, are new converts. He says, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven there are angels who always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. So, there are angels... Do behold in heaven. That's that's where the angels are. They're in heaven. The angels are not circling around about us. And in, we're not discussing guardian angels right now, but we're discussing the interest that angels have in us. Okay. Uh, and as we see that their angels uh, do, uh, as as we see here, they do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. So the angels are in heaven, but yet we see that the, the interest of these angels are in us. Okay. Um, look at First uh, Corinthians chapter four. Yes, First Corinthians chapter four. Now this is a passage where. It 
it seems that the, the church in Corinth, that there are those in Corinth who had developed a haughty attitude about who they were, and especially in regard to who Paul was. Um, and in fact, there were false teachers in Corinth that Paul was warning them about. Um, as we look in, in uh, verses 1 through 3, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So this is the attitude you and Corinth need to have about me and the other apostles, as Paul was writing to them. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. So that's pretty much Paul's whole point, that he is faithful to God. But with me is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of a man's judgment. Yea, judge not mine own self. For I know nothing but by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judges me is the Lord. So as a matter of perspective, so apparently they were judging Paul as, as to his credibility or, or uh, suitability for being an apostle. Is he a real apostle? In fact, many would criticize Paul apparent, apparent, through the things that he said. Apparently they were criticizing that Paul can't be a real apostle. You know, look, look, you know, look at the apostles, what they do. They charge, or they, they're being supported by whomever they're preaching to, okay? Whoever they're teaching, those, those people are supporting them. Did Paul ever ask that of you? No. See, he's not like the other apostle. He's not an apostle because that's what the other apostles do. And things like that. So as he looks here, he's, he's, he's saying that you need to account of me, that is, me and the other apostles, as a minister of Christ, Stewards of the mysteries of God. How valuable is that? How valuable was it that? Could you imagine if Paul were to take up residence here in Royce City, and he he would be here every every uh, every time we gathered together? The kind of teaching we'd get. How rich would that be? Hearing an inspired apostle. And so, as we think about, you need to consider account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Don't take us for granted, you know. Um, but to him, it wasn't a very big deal that they would be judging him regarding that because Christ is his judge. Um, and so in verse 6, he says, And these things, brethren, I have in the figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes. So he's relating these things to him and Apollos for the purpose of teaching them uh, to, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against the other. Um, so, uh, so, so there was an issue there that apparently they were having that of being arrogant, of, of, of having a superiority complex, you might say, um, over one over the other, and particularly about Paul. Uh, verse 7, for who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? So what makes you think that you're so different from anybody else? And what, did you what are you now that you didn't receive from teaching? Okay. Why dost thou glory as if thou hast, received, hast not received it? Why do you act as though you originated truth, basically? And, and uh, in verse 8, now ye are full, now ye are rich, ye have reigned as kings. I almost think this is almost uh, a bit uh, sarcastic. Now ye are full, now ye are rich. You have everything you want, okay? You, uh, or <laughs> as you think, you have everything you want or need. Ye have reigned as kings without us. <coughs> I would go to God, okay, I would to God ye did reign, that we also might reign with you. For I think that God has set forth us the apostles last. I think that God has put us in last place as regards social society and social aspects and the inner reactions of inner relations of, and communications with men. I think God has put us on the bottom rung, as it were. As it were, appointed to death. Now, to be appointed to death, it has more reference to uh, the games of the, the Roman games, where they would take, they would actually take Christians and put them in the, in the Roman games. I say Christians. It's, it's, it, it was debatable whether Paul meant literally that they had been put in the Roman games. You know what they would do? They would have, they'd give them a sword and a shield, and they'd have them fight gladiators, right? Or they'd put them in the arena and have lions, hungry lions to tear them to pieces. These are things, and it was like they were condemned. They were doomed. When they were put in that position, 
They were doomed to death. It was like, it was inevitable. They were, they were, they were going to die. And that's what Paul's saying. It's as though we were put in the arena and doomed to death. That's what he thinks that Paul, that, that's what Paul thought that God had done for the apostles. And it makes sense because even Jesus told Peter what manner of death he would die. What manner of life he would lead up to his, that he would die for his faith. You know, and you, you recall that it's only one apostle did not die a violent death. John, the one who, who penned the, the revelation. Um, and so as Paul says, you know, I think that God has set us forth us apostles last, as it were appointed to death, that we are doomed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. We're made a spectacle. We're, we're gazing. People are looking at us. We are made to be uh, like, like uh, to be watched. We're made to suffer like this, to be doomed to death, to be watched like the games in, in the Roman Colosseum. As people would come to the Colosseum to watch people die. And I, I, mean, I think about how sick that is. But as Paul says, I think that's what we, we've been doomed to. Death, we've been made a spectacle in the world and to angels and to men. Now, here's, here's what I'm getting at about that he was a spectacle to angels as well. So what does that mean? The angels were watching too. So what I'm getting at is as David would sing praises before the gods in praise of God, as, uh, um, as we see that, that Paul is discussing that we are, ga- we are gazing stocks, or we are spectacle, we are put out before to be watched, to be beheld before angels. They're watching. And as we see also that the angels were interested in looking into the prophecies of the Old Testament. So they're watching, they're learning, okay? And of course, as amazed as they must be, of course, this is speculation. The, ama- the amazement they must see in what God did for us. They didn't get that. We discussed that last week, that angels do not have any hope of everlasting life. Those angels who rebelled against God, who sinned against God, they had no hope. They had no plan by God to save them. But yet, God did this for us. And so they must look on amazing that God, he died for us. He went down as a servant to his own creation. He went down to be treated so horribly. The one who created them, and they treat him like that. They must be looking down with amazement at how this could be. And as they, were, as they, as they look at all these things, and of course, the fact that there are some believers, there's some who are benefiting from this, and as they watch us, and... We've, we've read accounts of, of their worship in Revelation about the, the, the beasts as, it, as is related that would sing holy, holy, holy all the time. Okay. And so as we've been, been able to see, peer just a, sl- just a little sliver a worship in heaven. So as we worship God in spirit and truth, it seems that they're able to see what's going on. Here's where we go back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 regarding that because of the angels. What would be so significant about the angels as regard to the women wearing veils? Well, it's a dis- as I related earlier, it's a discussion about propriety in a sense. Uh, the way that, that women would show a proper way in culture that they were to behave in respect of the differences in roles between men and women, the differences in, in authority between men and women, and that, uh, uh, that as pure as the angels are, as much as they, highly they regard the authority of God, and they do. I mean, to the point, you think about uh, that an angel would not even bring a railing accusation against Satan. He said, the angel said when they disputed the, the body of Moses, said, the Lord rebuke thee. Okay. How much, how high they regard God and his authority. Obviously fear. When they watched their fellow angels fall because of rebellion against God, and they saw the condemnation, they see what's prepared for them, for those angels. You, you got to imagine, I would, I say, I should say, I would imagine they have to have the highest regard and fear of God. Okay, 
And so as they look at, look at mankind for whom Christ died, that God sent his son to die for, and, and the awe they must have regarding that, said, I, uh, what a marvel that, uh, that as, as those few who have believed and obeyed, as they, they would be interested in watching and, uh, regarding it. And so as they would be watching our own worship. Now, I'm, I'm not going to try to, cre- I'm not creating a doctrine here, or a new idea, and I'm not at all advocating that we should look with awe upon angels for the purpose of worship or anything like that. But as we look at that, angels do have access to viewing our lives. They had access to viewing the lives of the apostles. <laughs> and as David would worship, he, it seemed that he, he believed and understood that angels were there to witness his worship. Um, and as, as angels in wor- viewing our worship, would they be offended with a, um, um, with something out of order as important as the authority that God has established? I see some confused look on, on, on faces. I'm not sure. If, are there any questions about what I'm saying? If, there's thing, if you think I'm saying something, uh, I'd rather be cleared up what I'm not saying than, to, than to someone going away thinking that, well, he's got some strange ideas. I don't, I don't mean that. Uh, that uh, but but uh, as I think about what could this mean as regarding because of the angels, uh, he's not talking about bad angels. It doesn't make sense. He's got to be talking about those angels that are good. And what would be so offensive to these angels as they would view this um, uh, regarding that? And, and particularly when, when you think about angels are viewing, apparently, and uh, they are concerned about the authority of God. And as they would see an abuse of God's order of things, it might offend them. As just as we would be offended if somebody came in here or anywhere we, we were, we, we began spouting out all these profanities and how evil God is and all this kind of stuff. We'd be quite offended. You know. um, okay. Or, or ev- oh, there are places I've, uh, that uh, I've heard of others have gone where uh, when they would go to worship in what was called, they had the Church of Christ sign out front, which when they went inside discovered it really wasn't the Church of Christ because they would use the instruments of music to, to accompany their, their worship. Of course, this was contrary to the pattern we learned in the New Testament. And so this was offensive. It was not worship in truth. It was worship according to will, not according to truth. Um, uh, and other things, you know, falsehoods that are taught, we're offended when, when uh, false doctrine is taught. Okay. So your question is, are angels offended when false doctrine is taught? It would seem to me that the angels are offended when things are not done right, whether it be false doctrines taught, whether it be things that are done that are not in order, things that are done out of confusion, uh, because, I mean, they're having access to the, the uh, <coughs> presence of God, you know. Okay, so it seems that there is a connection between worship, between congreg- congregational norms, and there's an, and angels who are present. In, in this verse, in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 10, there seems to be a, congreg- a connection between worship, congregational norms, and angels who are present. Um, in, this, in the case uh, in Corinth, the woman's uncovered head was an offense to the angels who understood and appreciated God's order of authority. So the fact that these women were not, uh, they were not expressing or showing forth an order of authority according to God's will, that was offensive to the angels. So as you think about what do, uh, and, and this gives one ca- ca- pause, you know, cause for pause, cause to pause in thought regarding if it is the case, and it seems to me that it is, that angels are, Witnessing whether they're present or whether they're just viewing worship wherever. Well, worship here. You know, we, we know that 
when we worship God, he's here. I don't mean literally, but rather he's certainly aware. What are we singing praises for if he can't hear us? What are we raising up our voices and prayers for if he can't hear us? Uh, and so as we understand that the Father is here and the Lord is here. When we commune with him in the, in the Lord's Supper, he's here. He said he was here. Okay. Um, and we, we also understand, of course, God is omniscient and omnipresent, so he can be everywhere at the same time and aware of everything. So as, as worship is going on throughout the whole world, throughout the whole day, as the earth revolves, he's aware of everything that's going on. And so why would it not be reasonable to, to uh, believe that angels would also be able to, prove, to uh, watch what we're doing? Now, that being the case, what are these heavenly beings witnessing? Well, what is the Father witnessing? What is the Son witnessing? And so uh, this is a list that uh, another has prepared. Are they seeing worshipers or whisperers? Are they seeing, witnessing singers or sleepers? Are they viewing participants or pew sitters? You know, worshiping God is not a spectator sport. Worshiping God is an active Everybody has, needs to participate in That's why we don't have a choir loft. Because when we sing, everybody sings to worship God. There's not just a select few who happen to have nice voices. That's not what it is. And so, so as we think about, are, are they seeing participants or pew sitters? Do we think that we are here alone? Do, is that what we think? Are we think we're just seeing to the, the walls and the ceiling? Or do we understand that God is here? That Christ is here? Look at Hebrews 1. 13 and 14. And we've looked at this verse before, but just to bring this back to memory, back to mind, Hebrews 1, 13 and 14 says, But to which of the angels did he at any time sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? So he's showing the preeminence of Christ that, that he not ever said anything to the angels, any angel of that, to that, of that nature, rather it was said of the Son of God. Okay, and verse 14, are, not, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? As we think about the role of angels, and they're God's, they, they perform God's purposes. This is not talking about guardian angels, and it's not talking about keeping us out of trouble. Although we have seen uh, examples where angels did deliver the apostles out of harm's way. We've seen Daniel and the lions did, delivering him, shutting the mouths of lions. We've seen, I say seen, we've read of the Chadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being sent to the fiery furnace, burning seven times hotter than ever before. And that one was like, that, that, that Nebuchadnezzar said was like, an, like a son of God, walking around in them, with them, and they were not harmed from this fiery furnace. And so we see that angels have through inspiration, we see the angels have been ministering spirits. Now, uh, I, I, I would not dare try to uh, muster up any kind of argument that, that an angel saved my life any time or anything like that, or that I've seen the effects of angels in my life. But I would say some things are uncanny. And, I, and we discussed about the role of angels even today, that they, they aren't sitting on their hands. They're as active as God is active. They're as active as Christ is active. They're as active as the Holy Spirit in the sense of the roles that they perform to fulfill God's will, according to his will. Okay, the Holy Spirit, I, I, I know it sounds like, no, the Holy Spirit doesn't heal people today in the sense of like healing miracles, but, but the Holy Spirit works by con convincing the soul of sin and convincing him of his need for God and, and the, the right way to approach God to find salvation. So, are not the angels ministering spirits to them, to the heirs of salvation? Okay. So it would seem that angels watch the work and worship of the church. They see things going on. Um, so when, when we go back to uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 10, where it says, because of the angels, it's merely be, it seems to me it's merely because as they watch, and they see something that would be offensive to them in, in the order of God's authority. That for the perp, for, for as Paul was discussing with the, 
this with them, that they should, that the women should wear the veils, not only, uh, not only to, so that we, we don't look like we're rebellious people in our society, that we're against the norms of our society, but also so that the angels who are witnessing this, our behavior, will not be offended as well. But it says, symbol of their authority. It doesn't say that they're just wearing this for, you know, being, uh, being observed. No, it, it, was, it, was, it was an expression of showing that they, they recognize the authority they, over them. Their head is their husband, okay? And it says they should have their head covered for a symbol of authority. Right. So who did they have authority over? Whom would who? Women have authority over it now. Well, well, as God has given us as parents, we're given authority over our children, okay? Right? And so the women do have authority over their children. Uh, oh, you mean a symbol of their authority? The, I think it's a symbol of the ones who have authority over them. Then after that, it says angels. So you'd almost think that that would relate to them. Let me look at that. Yeah, the, the way it's worded. I think it's a symbol of the authority that is over them. That would be their authority. It's not their personal authority that they, they wield. Rather, it's a symbol of the authority that is over them. The power on her head or symbol of authority because of the angels. Is that You're, you're looking at particular verse 10, right? And yours verse says a symbol of authority? Okay. And that's, that's pretty much... To have power or authority on her head, it basically it's, it's that thing she places upon her head to show that she has an authority over her. And she recognizes that. What? And then it says angels after that, so you would think if you read that these women have, would have authority over angels. Right, nevertheless, neither is a man without a woman, neither... And, and, well, as it's discussing, as, as yes, God has established that the men are to be the head over their wives, and the wives are to submit themselves to their their husbands, and they are, in that culture, they were to wear these veils to show that they recognized and respected that authority that was over them. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, we are so intertwined in our, our, our need for each other, because, you know, we are born of, of women. All, you know, men, there aren't any men except that there be women, you know. I th and so, neither is man without the woman, neither is woman without the man in the Lord. Um, and so he, in, in verses 11 and 12, he's discussing the inter-reliance that men and women have. Sufficient? Okay. So that symbol, symbol of authority, it wasn't saying that she, 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 it, that she is having authority over others as much as it was, it was a symbol showing that she understood her own, her, her, uh, that which is her head and respected that and lived by that. Yeah, yeah. And so this, this, this actually transcends the, the concept of whether we ought, women ought to wear hats in worship. That's not what the discussion is. In that day and age, it was the norm that women show their respect and understanding of their greater authority over, under, you know, they even in their culture, the women respected their husbands, okay? Um, but these women had the, they could pray and prophesy, so to speak, you have authority, you, you, to receive prophecy, you're probably receiving it from angels, so they're, yes, well, you have authority over these angels to receive well, yeah, I'm not sure that the authority, the, I think the prophecy came from the Holy Spirit. I don't think the angels gave them this. I think it was something came from the Holy Spirit. And it's a fact. There were prophetesses. Um, uh, but as we read, we'll read in the next chapter 14 and on Wednesday, that, we'll just, that there is a proper avenue by proper way, procedure they were to come together. When they come together and prophecy, this is how they would do it. And it was... Uh, it, the instructions they had did not supersede the other instructions about a woman teaching over a man in a dominant role. We look at, uh, of course, Aquila and Priscilla, Priscilla being the wife of Aquila, who both took Apollos aside to, to expound upon him the more, more perfectly, the more accurately the way of, of the Lord, right? 
Um, but th that does not supersede that a woman is not to take authority over man, that a woman is not to teach in a way that is authoritative over man. Uh, that's, um, so that's regarding, yeah. And so, yeah, the authority over, we're a little lower than the angels. I mean, we read about that in Hebrews, that, that uh, Christ was made a little lower than the angels. And so we understand that his becoming a man, becoming flesh, put him in a, in a, in a, a level that was, put himself lower than the angels in that sense. Of course, he had authority over the angels because he could call them. He had legions of angels he could call there at his beck and call. But uh, he was made in form a little lower than the angels. So that tells us wh where do we stand then, especially since mankind is guilty of sins and, and se se severed his relationship with God. Uh, so, I mean, so I can't imagine that there would be, ever be our being authority over angels. In fact, when you look at John, when John bowed down before the angels, the angels said, get up, I'm a fellow servant as you are. So, so as I think about even in heaven, we will, still won't have authority over angels, and just different roles. I, I hope I haven't confused anybody, but as I as I try, I tried my best to try to explain what this could possibly mean in in, in 1 Corinthians eleven verse ten because of the angels, and that makes more sense to me than anything else. Especially some of the bizarre ideas they've had. I, I mentioned I think last week regarding attempt that the women without the veil would be a temptation to the, to the angels, and that that's absurd. Yeah, so. I appreciate your interest in the comments and questions. If there are any questions or uncertainties, you know, I don't want to leave with the idea, anybody having the idea that I'm bringing in some heresy or anything. It's just, uh, <laughs> how do we explain that? How do we explain that passage regarding the angels? And your point, too, you know, that the fact that they were angels that, you know, yeah. were observing yeah. sort of pretty yeah. good idea. Way it it's just yeah. So, anyway, we'll uh, continue on with another topic. I figure we will change our topic for next quarter. Come, uh, we have um, two more two more Sundays uh, left in this quarter, left in this year, and um, either I'll continue with angels or I might start it fresh and anew with something before the end of the, end of the quarter, but um, it's time to change. <laughs>